if the secret to success has been right in front of us all along, written, spoken, and practiced by the greatest minds in history? In this timeless message by Earl Nightingale, we uncover a universal law that governs every aspect of our lives. Our rewards are always proportional to our service. It's a principle as old as humanity itself, expressed in countless ways. From the biblical adage, as you sow, so shall you reap, to Newton's law of action and reaction. This message isn't just about abstract philosophy. It's about practical, transformative truth. Nightingale invites us to reflect on the service we provide to others, urging us to understand that the rewards we seek, whether financial, emotional, or spiritual, are a direct result of our contributions to the world around us. Through vivid metaphors and compelling examples, Nightingale challenges us to evaluate how we think, act, and serve. If you're ready to embrace this simple yet profound truth, this message will change the way you approach your goals, your work, and your relationships. Let's explore how aligning with this universal law can lead to a life of fulfillment, achievement, and lasting impact. I'm sure you find it as amazing as the rest of us do that the great majority of people have to learn things the hard way, generation after generation. It's natural to think that if a great discovery was made in a particular generation, all the succeeding generations would know about it and utilize it for their own good. But to a large extent, such is not the case. It's true with inventions and discoveries which obviously affect our lives, but it frequently is not true when it comes to the great invisible laws which determine the direction of our destiny here on Earth. This law has been written thousands of times by the greatest minds the world has produced, and as a result, has appeared in many forms. For our purpose, it might best be put this way. Our rewards in life will always match our service. It's another way of saying, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And it's been written in many ways in every language on earth. Sir Isaac Newton, in promulgating his laws of physics, put this one in this way. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In saying our rewards in life will always match our service, you'll almost always get general agreement. People will nod their heads and say, yes, that's certainly true. Then they'll go their way and never realize, for the most part, how close they came to truth, so great and all-enveloping that their every thought and action is affected by it. I like to think of this law in the form of a giant apothecary scale, the kind with a cross arm from which hang two bowls on chains. One of the bowls is marked rewards, the other is labeled service. Whatever we put into the bowl marked service, the world will match in the bowl marked rewards. How we think, talk, act and conduct ourselves is what we have to put into the bowl marked service and to the extent and nature of our service will be determined our rewards. If any person alive is discontented with his rewards, he should examine his service. Action, reaction. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. What you put out is what you must get back in return. So simple, so basic, so true, and yet so misunderstood. If a business is not expanding to the quick and exciting tempo of the times, it must examine its contribution, its service. If a person is unhappy with his income, he must examine and re-evaluate his service. Now, whom do we serve? We serve humanity. And humanity to any given individual is the people with whom he comes in contact. It's the family, friends, co-workers, customers, prospects, everyone, everyone with whom we have contact is to us humanity. And to the extent that we serve these people will our rewards be determined. Never before in the history of the world have human beings been so interdependent. It's as impossible to live without serving others as it would be to live if others were not constantly serving us. And this is good. The more closely knit this interdependence becomes, the greater will become human achievement. We need each other and we literally cannot live without one another. Every time we strike a match, drink a glass of water, turn on the lights, pick up the phone, drive our car, put on our clothes, take a bath, mow the lawn, or go fishing, we're being served by other human beings. Every time you look at your watch, you're being served by a great industry and by the efforts of hundreds of human beings. We all seek rewards, and we should understand that rewards come in two forms, tangible and psychic. That is, rewards include the money we earn, the home we buy, the car we drive, the clothes we wear, and they also include the way we feel, our enjoyment, our peace of mind, 
our inner satisfaction. But remember this, whatever it is you seek in the form of rewards, you must first earn in the form of service to others. All attempts to abrogate, to sidestep this law will end in failure, frustration, and even ultimate demoralization. We can see this frustration on every side. We can see it in the tense, strained, and nervous faces, in the mountains of tranquilizers which are consumed every day. And we can also see it in the slack, bovine-like faces of those who have found the whole game too complicated and have simply given up, surrendered to the push and pull of circumstances. How much of this do you suppose is due to the misunderstanding or to the ignorance of this simple and wonderful law of nature? It's my belief that a great deal can be traced to this cause. Now, do you understand this law, fully understand it, intellectually and emotionally? If you do, you can chart a wonderful course through life. Now, let's get specific. Just as a child will put its fingers in the way of a closing door, just as a speeding driver discovers he's not going to make the curve, how many times have you been confounded because you acted contrary to the rules, not only the rules of man, but the rules of nature. How many times have you been in the position of the man who sat in front of the cold stove and said, give me heat and then I'll give you some wood? People in life are like that. And you can say that people are divided into those who understand that the wood must be added before they can expect warmth and those who feel they should get warmth whether they do anything about it or not, or who feel they should get maximum heat from a small supply of wood. We've said that a man's discontent can be said to be represented by the distance between what he has and what he wants. Once he has achieved that which he wants, the odds are good that he'll want still more, for that's the way of people, and that's good. Constructive discontent is what gives us our continuing upward spiral of civilization. Now, what you should do is determine what it is you want. Look objectively at the place in which you now find yourself and determine ways of increasing your service so that you will earn the rewards you seek. This puts thinking and creative activity into living. It also assures us that our goals can be achieved by individual effort. A person's world can be compared to a plot of ground. It exists, it's there. It has inherent within itself an amazing potential. And it's prepared to react to the man's every action. In fact, it must. Whatever your job happens to be, think of it for a moment as this plot of ground. In the beginning, there's nothing there but earth. If the man just sits and watches it, nothing will happen. If he tosses a few seeds on it, the rain and the soil's natural fertility will probably combine to reward him with a few results for his efforts. Action, reaction. It all depends upon just what he wants from this plot of earth. It's what he wants that he must first decide upon. Let's say he wants a beautiful lawn bordered by flower gardens with a big tree in the shade of which he can one day sit and admire his work. So he marks off the areas for the garden, cultivates, smooths, and cleans the soil of stones and trash, plants his lawn and his tree and his flowers. From this point on, anyone observing this plot of land can evaluate in a second the amount of service, the contribution this man is giving to his project. How can he tell? He can tell by seeing what the land is giving back to the man. Planting the plot is only the first step. We're given the plot, and that's all we should be given. It's what we do with it that will determine its degree of greatness and success. It's like the well-known story of the preacher who was driving by a beautiful farm. The fields were beautifully cultivated and abundant with well-cared-for crops. The fences, house, and barns were clean and painted. A row of fine trees led from the road to the house where there was a shaded lawn and flower beds. It was a great sight to behold. So when the farmer working in the field got to the end of a row near the road, the preacher called out to him and said, God has blessed you with a beautiful farm. And the farmer stopped and thought a moment and replied, Yes, he has, and I'm grateful. But you should have seen it when he had it all to himself. You see, the farmer understood that he had been blessed with a fine farm, but he was also aware that it was his own love and labor working with God which had brought it to its present state. Each of us is given a plot to work, a lifetime, and the work we've chosen. Like the farmer, we'll be grateful if we have the vision, imagination, and intelligence to build well and successfully upon the seemingly unimpressive land of our beginning. Or we can let it fall into a haphazard condition with no real continuity or purpose behind it, with unpainted ramshackle buildings surrounded by weeds and debris. It's the same land. It's what we do with it that makes the difference. The miracle is there. 
if only we're wise enough to see it and realize that our fulfillment as individuals depends upon our reaction to what we've been given. Now, in thinking of ways of increasing your service, read books on your line of work. Read what other men in your same line of business have found to work well for them. But at the same time, think of original and creative ways of increasing your service, ways that are unique with you and the way you are. Going at it strong for a week or a month and then falling back into old habits is just like working for a week or a month on that plot of ground and then leaving it to its own devices. Before long, it'll be no better than before. Each morning and during the day, ask yourself this question. How can I increase my service today, knowing that my rewards in life must be in exact proportion to my service? Do this every day for 30 full days and you will have formed one of the most valuable habits in the world. Horace Mann wrote, If any man seeks for greatness, let him forget greatness and ask for truth, and he will find both. You see, you can cut away all the confusion and complications and nagging worries and vague half-formed fears by returning to the great truths, the great laws, the great verities on which all success, all accomplishment is built. If you're worried about your income or your future, you're concentrating on the wrong end of the scale. Look at the other end. Concern yourself only with increasing your service, with becoming great where you are, and your income and your future will take care of themselves. Don't sit in front of the cold stove and ask for heat, for you can sit there until you freeze to death. Pile in the wood, serve first, and the heat will come as a result. Next time you're off by yourself in a quiet place, contemplate your plot of ground and begin now to sow the seeds which will yield you a rich harvest. In William James' essay on vital reserves, he wrote, Compared with what we ought to be, we're only half awake. Our fires are damped, our drafts are checked. We're making use of only a small part of our possible mental and physical resources. Stating the thing broadly, he went on, The human individual thus lives usually far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. He energizes below his maximum, and he behaves below his optimum. All right, how can we correct the situation? Well, William James gives us the answer. He wrote, either some unusual stimulus fills them with emotional excitement, or some unusual idea of necessity induces them to make an extra effort of will. Excitements, ideas, and efforts, in a word, are what carry us over the dam. All right, let your goal represent the excitements. Your ideas and efforts will weigh down the service end of the scale, and the rewards must and will follow. They will be yours. They are yours the moment you realize this truth. <laughs>